You're listening to the Investor Success Podcast, the hit weekly show featuring inspirational stories to help real estate entrepreneurs do more deals while increasing their cash flow and their net worth. My name is Jim Ingersoll and I'm the host for the podcast today. Thanks for tuning in. Today, if you're listening on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, or YouTube, we want to give you a special shout out and welcome. It's nice to have you along today. I've got a free gift for you today. If you go to bigmoneyinvestor.com uh, backslash fix dash flip, bigmoneyinvestor.com backslash fix dash flip, you can pick up a documentation kit. It's like an easy swipe file and you're going to love the content of it. So go check that out. I created this podcast to help motivate and inspire people to take massive action and build your, your investing and your life the right way, the way that you want to carve it out. And I want to welcome you to our show today. Today we're going to focus on assets that create long-term and, and long-lasting perpetual wealth that won't go away. I also want to thank all of our regular success listeners. It's great to have you back. Thanks for your feedback. Thanks for those who have been leaving me some review in iTunes. I really appreciate that as well. If this is your first time tuning into our show today, I encourage you to go check out the other uh, shows and the other episodes as well. You're going to learn a ton. You're going to be inspired and you're, want, you're going to want to go out and take action investing in some great real estate deals. We have a fantastic show lined up today with a, with a really inspiring guest that you're going to absolutely love. And our guest today is Dr. Buck Joffrey. Buck, welcome to the Investor Success Podcast today. Thanks for having me, Jim. All right, let me tell you a little bit about Buck so you can get to know him before we hear his story. Buck is an accomplished physician, entrepreneur, asset manager, and a podcaster. You're going to love his podcast as well, and we'll get you to uh, uh, hear about that in a few minutes. Since finishing his medical training in 2008, he's had phenomenal success through his startup businesses and his investments going from being broke to having an eight-figure net worth. And in order to help his high-paid professional colleagues, he started a financial educational website called WealthFormula.com. You're going to want to go write that down and check it out, WealthFormula.com. And host the popular Wealth Formula podcast as well. Buck knows the old mantra of investing in a diversified portfolio of stocks, bonds, and mutual funds is truly outdated and dangerous for high-paid professionals, given the volatility and the instability of the current global economy, and I couldn't agree anymore. Therefore, he advocates entrepreneurship and or investing in hard assets that produce a cash flow in a more reliable way of approaching personal finance. So through a strong foundation of financial education, emphasis on cash flow, Buck teaches professionals how to take charge of their money and absolutely prosper in today's market. Buck, welcome. It's nice to have you along today. Yeah, thank you, Jim. So tell us a little bit about your backstory and and uh, let us get to know you a little bit more. Yeah, so uh, I am a uh, your typical, uh, you know, A student. Uh, went to school, got straight A's, went to college, got straight A's, went to medical school, graduated Phi Beta Kappa, wow. started out in a neurosurgery residency, uh, switched over to head and neck without the brain. Uh, this finished this residency in in uh, 2008, and at that point, um, as um, and up to that point, all I was really concerned about was being uh, the the smart kid on the block and um, you know doing you know doing things that sounded really smart and scary. And um, you know I had some significant uh, interest in research and that sort of thing as well. But in 2008, by that point, I had I had sort of gotten burned out a little bit with the whole idea of academics and academic uh, medicine, and I was looking for something else. And um, you know, I did do a facial plastic. I I did a head and neck surgery residency, and then trained also in facial plastic surgery. So I um, I had training in a lot of things. I decided to take my shot at. Um, um, you know, the facial plastic surgery and cosmetics world. So I, I, I went in, started working for a company there uh, pretty quickly after residency and sort of realized pretty quickly that this corporate world um, wasn't really for me because the way I like to do things um, as a physician, as a surgeon and so on and so forth, were getting heavily influenced by the corporate side. And I didn't like being told what to do. Long story short, uh, about eight months into it, seven or eight months into it, 
uh, not because of you know any quality of care issues, but just because of my lack of wanting to you know um, practice the way that the uh, managers wanted me to, rather than the way I thought a physician should. They fired me, and that was probably the best thing that happened to me because uh, the first time in my life, really, it was a major failure, and um, you know uh, I I wasn't used to it. So I realized that you know for me. The idea of going out and getting another job just wasn't going to work because I'm sure the managers uh, that fired me, you know, they, uh, you know, I, I had my reasons for not liking them, but they had probably pretty good reasons for not liking me. It's just, it's a world where if you work for somebody, you kind of have to do what they tell you to do. And I wasn't <laughs> interested in that. And so, so at that point, I started my first business and I started a fr- my first business. It was similar in uh, character to the one I was working for. And, um, I, you know, I didn't know anything about business, but, uh, went out there and, you know, through the school, school hard knocks, started it up. Um, I ran it like a business, did heavy marketing, TV, internet, radio. And before you know it, uh, 18 months later, I was a millionaire. Wow. So, yeah. So that's how journey. it started. Yeah. And, and right. That's right. And the, the cool thing about it was I didn't know anything about business. This is really important. Okay. Yeah. Cause there's people out there right now saying I'm a professional, you know, I studied for this, I studied for that. Well, geez, I was, you know, you're talking to a guy who was drilling through skulls, right? I had no idea about money, about anything, and uh, other than, than my craft, and I started a business, and I did it because I taught myself, and then I got the bug, and then I kept starting other businesses and buying real estate, and before you know it, I became a serial entrepreneur, and then I had to figure out what to do with the money, so I had to teach myself how to invest. So back in those early days, what were some of the businesses that you did that you actually enjoyed and did well with um, having left corporate America? Yeah. So after leaving, so I started, uh, my first business was this uh, business in cosmetic surgery. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that was the one where I was practicing and I, where I made my first uh, stash of money. And um, after that, um, I just started getting into the real estate business and bought some real estate, started uh and I consider those businesses sure. again because they're not they're not just assets. They you know they have money coming in, money coming out, and there's a manager. And I'm not there every day, so they're businesses I own. So I bought real estate. Um, I also started another uh, another business in the um, the health uh, okay. uh, the allergy allergy and sinus business, and then I started another one in the autism business. These are businesses some of them I don't know any didn't know anything about. Right. So you. They weren't like, oh, gosh, you're a doctor, therefore you can do it. Uh, they, they just happened to be things that I learned about, and I thought they were good business models. So, so that's, that's, basically, uh, that's basically it. So how did you get started buying and in, investing into real estate? And what did those first investments look like, and how long ago was that? Yeah, so um, I started investing uh, you know, shortly after I started making money. So when I started that business and all of a sudden I had this money in my pocket, I had to figure out what to do with it. And I never really thought about it because I never really had any money in my pocket. Right. But um, I went back to this, um, the fact that when I was growing up, my dad, um, my dad, and he continues to be, a, he's a landlord. Mm-hmm. Now, he is a classic landlord. You know, he's the guy who gets every phone call uh, for for every issue, and he literally gets phone calls from people looking for apartments that he shows them himself. But he did really well throughout his life. Yep. But the one thing I'll, I'll tell you is that I got from watching that was I had no interest in being a landlord. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I did see was that he made plenty of money with real estate. And I didn't understand the stock market. I looked around, you know, in 2008, that's, you know, pretty good time to uh, (laughs) see what was going on. And I saw all these people losing, you know, half their wealth uh, in a matter of days. um, And I wasn't interested in that. So I wanted to go out and and invest in things that I thought uh, made sense. And I saw work for my dad for my entire life. So real estate is where I started. And at that time, you can imagine there was some pretty good deals around. Um, and, um, you know, I, that was pretty much it. I mean, I, it was, a, it was a good market to get started in. Uh, I made some mistakes early on, but, but overall, uh, you know, came out pretty, pretty well. Well, real estate is pretty forgiving and all of us make mistakes. Anybody who tells you they didn't make mistakes in real estate is not telling you the truth. 
but if you if you buy right it's reasonably forgiving and if you hold on to stuff over time it forgives itself that way as well but um, were you investing like in single family homes how did you get started I never started with single family homes yeah. um, I started you know I started directly into multifamily um, commercial mm -hmm. uh, yeah apartment building so um, generally over 10 units. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and the reason for that was that, you know, I wasn't planning on being a landlord anyway. Right. Um, so to me, it didn't matter how many units there was. In fact, the way I thought about it was in terms of, you know, what, what's, what's the thing you don't want when you have, um, when you have, a, when you have a rental, you, you don't want vacancy, right? Well, with a single family house, you got two options. You're either a hundred percent vacant <laughs> Or zero percent vacant, and and so I don't I didn't like the idea of that. I like the idea of having more doors to again sort of hedge that um, you know hedge Vacancy. vacancies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's great. So you started buying small apartment complexes, ten plus units, and where were you at? Like in the country, where were you living at that point? Chicago, and oh, okay. uh, that's that's where I am now. But oh, okay. and, and that's where I that's where uh, that's where I was focused on. Mm -hmm. And that's that's been a really good market the last several years. So that's that's good. So give me give me some ideas why you went with um, buying that type of asset in that class, um, knowing that your goal was to create perpetual wealth. Well, I mean, I think you have to look at. Um, a little bit broader. I look at it a little uh -huh. bit broader. Okay, obviously cash flow is a big deal, but if you if you philosophically, you know, I believe in investing in real assets. Mm -hmm. And real assets can be um, real estate, land, precious metals. I mean, these things are real wealth. I mean, they don't lose uh, value overnight just because there was a computer glitch in Wall Street or because a bank like Lehman Brothers goes out of business. Uh, and, you know. It, when the markets crashed in 2008, a lot of people literally lost their wealth overnight. And th and that's not real wealth. I mean, that's owning worthless paper is what that is. And what we know from history is that um, that real assets maintain value over time. And in most cases, they'll actually increase in value. If you look, for example, um, at gold, gold is a great example of a real asset. Now, it's actually money. Gold is money. That's the way I like to think of it. So I don't think of it as something that's going to throw off cash flow. But it's a real asset. And it's a real asset because an ounce of gold would buy you, uh, you could, in, in, in ancient Rome, could buy you a fancy toga. And an ounce of gold today <laughs> will buy you a fancy Armani suit. Okay? That's real. I love that's that, Buck. Gold. That's good. Yeah, that's yeah. That's where the rubber hits the road, right? That's right. So what you have there is you have something that maintains value, right? And so when you look at the families throughout time, uh, you know, throughout the world that maintain generational wealth in Europe, especially, you see that because there's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years these people have had, you know, uh, they've had wealth. You know, they've been wealthy families for 500 years. And it's not because they owned a bunch of paper. They didn't own stocks, bonds, mutual funds. It's because they own real stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's that's really what it's all about for me. So I am a big fan of of uh, of real estate because it also throws off cash flow. But I mean, listen, I'm also a big fan of uh, of energy investments, a big fan of of, you know, owning um, you know, other people's debt. I mean, again, that's be the that's bank. A, yeah, be the bank, you know, nothing else. So, so there's lots of things that they're they're easy to understand. They're real, and and that's what I like to own. Let me uh, let me ask you this because you've invested in a lot of apartment complexes. What are some fundamentals if somebody's looking to say migrate from single family homes to apartments or just getting started? What would a good deal look like um, and what should some of that upfront due diligence um, look like? Uh, that's a good question. Um, first, I think let's talk about why you would want to transition to multifamily okay. from single family houses. I think that's a that's really something to think about. And the reason that I like multifamily, in addition to the idea of, you know, not zero versus 100 vacancy, is that there is uh first of all it's scalable okay mm -hmm. you you have the 
whole idea that you can you know you can get more people in and you can you can use some of the same resources to take care of those uh, those residents. The next thing, and probably one of the most important things to me, is the way that a multi multifamily asset or any commercial asset is judged in terms of its value is is not really that subjective. Okay, you might look at a house in a neighborhood and say, well, this house is worth, you know, fifty thousand dollars. It's worth hundred thousand dollars, whatever. Right. And the rent you get from that, hopefully, you get a rent that you know it 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 makes it so that you make a few bucks on the on the property once the mortgage principal and interest is paid. And but that, in my mind, is a little bit speculative, to a certain degree. The the beauty of a commercial property, which I mean specifically uh, residential commercial, five units and above, is the way that it's valued is dependent entirely on the net operating income. So what that means is it's not what somebody looks at it and says, gosh, this house, uh, you know, it's worth eighty, ninety thousand dollars 90000 No. What it is is you know what the net operating income is. You know what, you know, the, the, the cap rate in the area is the capitalization rate, and it's a, it's simple math, right? So the be, the other beauty of it is if you want to increase the value of that property, you can force equity into it. So if you can, say you've got a 100-unit building and you increase rent in every one of those units by 100 bucks, that's going to increase the net operating income and therefore the value of the building. So – it's a very predictable Forced appreciation. investment. That's and right. What kind of cap rates um, should should people be looking to pick up these days? Because they're they're lower than they were before. It, it appears. Yeah, it's ridiculous right now. And and here here's it's a tricky question because first of all, it's market dependent as mm-hmm. all real estate is 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 about the market. The second the second issue is the size of the apartment unit. Uh, apart, apartment building. That's a good so, point. as you as you know, right now those those big investors, those institutional investors that used to sit in the stock market and bond market, they're all they're all trying to find a better place for their money. So a lot of them are actually moving into purchasing large apartment complexes. So the challenge is. That the bigger that the bigger uh, apartment complex uh, complexes, uh, the ones say in the ten million and above range, uh, it's a very crowded space, particularly in the um, in the in the larger markets. So that's Chicago, uh, whether that's you know now Dallas, the Chinese are going to Dallas. Um, now, but, but when it gets crowded like that, syndicators like me, people who are trying to put together deals for investors, we get squeezed a little bit too because we might be looking of we might have been looking at putting together deals for our investors in the neighborhood of you know 7 to 12 million dollars but now we're getting pushed down because the cap rates are squeezed down there because of the institutional investors right so ironically the best deals are the cheaper deals mm-hmm. okay and the the problem with getting too cheap is that you run into too many mom and pop investors and they all want in so you have to be expensive enough for the mom and pops not to be able to reach it. So you might say, okay, maybe it's a million dollar property, but you have to keep out of the range of, of the, of the, uh, of the institutional investors. So it's going to be somewhere probably below 4 million. So one to 4 million. Now to specifically with cap rates, it's dependent very much on location. Um, you know, in Chicago, in 2012, I picked up a couple of buildings with cap rates near nine. Wow. And, and uh, you know, after leverage, the return on investment was ridiculous. You know, it's 15% plus. Right. But, but, the, but now, those same areas, those buildings are now with cap rates around, you know, six or sub six. It's hard to make money on that. It, it's hard to make Created money. Created nice equity for the ones you did pr- pick up. Oh, huge, huge equity. Because <laughs> if, yeah. if you bought it as, at a nine and it's worth a six. Yep. Uh, over, yeah, over, you know, seven, seven sure. figure equity gains in, bo- in, in those, both of those buildings I bought. 
So th those are great tips on, on cap rates. So you think the sweet spot's one to $4 million, that way you avoid the institutional investors and you also avoid the mom and pop guys picking up quads and things like that that are, that are cheaper. So maybe yeah, you know, 10 to 20 and, units. And, I, units. and I'll tell you that you know, some of your listeners might, might be out there going, well, listen, I haven't invested in real estate and one to $4 million sounds like a lot of money. Well, it is a lot of money, right? But there are syndicators, I mean, including myself, who are looking for deals in that range. So if you're willing to be a limited partner on a deal, you can still very likely, uh, you know, get deals that are going to throw off double digit returns. But, um, you know, it's 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 sort of hard to do this. I would say as an individual investor, it's probably not the best time in the world to get in the market. Tell us a little bit about how the, the syndicating works and what you offer in that regard and, and of course, how people could get a hold of you if, if they want to work with you. Well, so so syndication is is essentially just, um, you know, it's, it's, it's getting to participate in ownership of an asset, you know, and we call it fractional ownership. So, for example, you look around – you know, you may look around and you're driving and you see these great big towers or you see, you know, these great big apartment complexes. Very, very rarely are those buildings owned by a single person. They're owned by or a single family. They're typically owned by what's called a syndication. And a syndication is it's a group of investors led by uh, somebody called a syndicator or a sponsor. And the syndicator or sponsor is typically the person with expertise in the area who identifies the deal, puts the deal together, makes it make sense, raises the money from the investors, and then they uh, and then the investors act as limited partners in the deal. So the value of that is now the sponsor obviously is going to take a certain a uh, certain cut of the deal for for putting it together and managing the asset as the ma uh, asset manager. But the advantage to the limited partner is they get all the benefits of real estate, notably the cash flow they get. Uh, and bigger than that probably is the depreciation. So, for example, if a an investor is getting 8% return on investment, which may not seem huge, uh, because of the depreciation offset in uh, in multifamily real estate, that 8% will be a real 8%. It won't be 8% and then taxed at capital gains. So, for example, if you if you did a, if you did 8% uh, in in a deal like this, you'd get to keep. In most cases, you're going to be able to keep that full 8% without being taxed on it. It's tax deferred. Uh, it's 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 uh, mm -hmm. tax free income, and that's that's one of the beauties of um, real estate assets that produce cash flow. the The depreciation benefit is enormous, um, and you I always love it in April um, of every year, watching it really come into play, and it's just a huge kick um, for a great benefit for sure. Um, of course, if you re if you resell, then you got recapture and other tax things, unless you do a ten thirty one exchange, of course, but. It's a great way to go, and it's a huge, huge benefit. Um, so, a syndication that you're doing is similar to a fund. Yeah, I, there's there's a couple of different things that I, I I'm doing. One is, uh, you know, I'm right now I'm still in the process of, you know, looking for deals. Um, as okay. you mentioned, the deals are a little bit tougher. I'm looking in a few different markets. I'm looking in Chicago. I'm looking in Dallas. I'm looking in Oklahoma, and um, and so. Putting together deals for you know for for investors, uh, that's one thing. The other thing that I'm working on, which I haven't really gotten, um, I haven't completed yet, but I think it's a good project, is to create a fund, and it's a essentially a fund. It's an opportunistic fund that allows uh, me as the fund manager to go out and try to put our money into things that are making money. Just to give you an example, you know there there are uh, people I know who've got great opportunities out there that are yielding ten to twelve percent. Right. But you may not want to put all your money in one fund. I mean, of course, there's always risk to everything, right? So, so what we what with this fund, what we do is we would um, we would create a um, 
you know, a diversified portfolio of real asset investing. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, I think it's a pretty unique opportunity and I'm, I'm still uh, working on putting it together, but I think it'll be a great option for people, particularly if you look at, you know, what the alternatives are. I mean, if you, uh, you know, if you're in, in uh, the paper markets right now with such volatility with all the equity markets, you have no idea what you're going to get. And the goal in this kind of fund would be, okay, well, you may not get 12%, but you might be able to get you know, 8% on a regular basis and not necessarily worry on a day-to-day basis, you know, right. uh, if Lehman Brothers went out of out of business. So, you know, and I think yeah. capital preservation is something that people are legitimately worried about with the stock market and things like that. I mean, I think people have legitimate reason to wake up in the night and be nervous. Yeah, I, I agree with that. In fact, um, you know, I had a big chunk of money sitting in Deutsche Bank, uh-huh. uh, and um, and um, I had, you know, I just recently realized, go, gosh, these guys might go out, and uh, you know, you know, the FDIC is only going to, you know, protect you for about two hundred fifty thousand right. dollars, and you know, there's all these new regulations that a lot of people don't know about um, with regard to bail-ins and that sort of thing going on. Uh, and, um, you know, if you're, if you've got more than $250,000 in any account and, you know, that's not a lot of people, but there are going to be people out there. I would think twice about separating that out into, into separate banks. For sure. I totally agree with that. All right. Um, do you have any, uh, success tips, habits, books you've read recently that you could share uh, with our listeners as well? Well, I mean, uh, in terms of, um, in terms of entrepreneurship, I think mm-hmm. that um, you know the 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 thing that I I've realized is that um, I mean it sounds kind of basic, but you just have to go out there and try, right? The problem with the the problem with the way that we are programmed in our educational system right now is that you know when we're when we're growing up, we we're told everything that we need to do and what to learn and everything in order to be a success. And the problem with that is that the real world doesn't work that way. And that's why a lot of people find this certain level of, of uh, apathy or it's not even apathy. It's just the kind of sense. Of, I don't know what to do because, you know, no one's telling me what to do. And that's why it's so easy for, you know, guys on Wall Street to come and tell us what to do. And then we do it. We just put our money into things. Right. They tell us what to do. But in the real world and with your money, you actually have to go out there and you have to make an effort to learn about things. And in the entrepreneurial world, you're going to have to go out there and take some risks and you might fail. But the good thing is that whenever you fail, you will learn. That's when you learn. Um, You know, I can I've had plenty of failures and I've had plenty of successes and I haven't learned nearly as much from my success as I have my failures. Yeah, and that's a great tip. Don't be afraid to fail. And I think the key when you do fail is the recovery period. So if you fail, just get up off your feet, get off the ground and, and get yourself moving forward again, I think is is really critical. Is one of the things I've learned is it's okay to fail. It's good to fail. You're going to learn a lot. Just get yourself up and get moving quickly. Don't delay. The other thing I would say is in terms of investing, there's a concept that, um, Jim, you know, which is which is velocity. All oh, right. Yeah. And I think that's something that um, is really important. It's one of the reasons why I'm thinking about starting this other fund for my investors, because a lot of us are sitting around waiting for the next big deal. And the challenge with that is that they don't always come around. And in the meantime, your ba- your money sitting in the bank making one per- less than one percent. Um, you know, the the important thing is not always the return on investment. There's capital preservation, and there's also the idea of continuously putting it in something that is going to continue to make money. So. If you find a, uh, you know, in a fund, say in a fund, you could do seven or eight percent, but you can start it today or you could wait six months for the next real estate deal. You might be it might be a good idea to put some of that money into something right now and make it grow. Okay, great tips. All right. um, And everybody, make sure you check out uh, Buck's website. It's wealthformula.com and his uh, podcast as well, which is the Wealth Formula podcast, because you're going to learn a lot. As you can tell, Buck is very, very smart 
and he's got a lot of a lot of experience to share. So go to wealthformula.com, check out his podcast also Wealth Formula Podcast. Buck, I want to thank you for being my guest today. It's been really good to have this discussion on building perpetual wealth. Thank you for having me. All right, that's it for this very special episode of the Investor Success Podcast. Thanks again for tuning in on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, iHeart, wherever you're listening today. Thanks again for all of our loyal success listeners. We really appreciate you guys, and it's been great to share this time with you today. My name is Jim Ingersoll. I'm not only the host of this podcast, I'm also the founder of the Investor Success Mastermind. And you can check out all the information on our, on our mastermind at InvestorSuccessMastermind.com. And get out there and make some deals. Put deals together. Don't be afraid to fail. We heard that today. And you may want to go back and, and listen again, take some notes, because we have a lot of great information on multifamily investing as well. Thanks again, everybody, for tuning in and have a great day.